Welcome to the Heart of Soul podcast, an exploration of who you are, what you are, and why you are, offering new ways to investigate age-old questions at the heart of you. Hi, it's Joseph, and thanks for listening to the Heart of Soul podcast. First, I want to announce again that we launched the videos of this podcast on YouTube. YouTube.com slash at the heart of soul will get you there. So if you want to see us and not just listen, now you can. We continue our series on relationality and begin today a sub-series in the domain of sexualized relationality. In this episode, how the conventional idea that compromise is the foundation of relationships is immature, how the inauthentic self splits the second and fourth chakras in third, why what feels good or bad doesn't work to guide relationality, how every relational space is co-created, and of course, a lot more. I remind you, as always, to please listen to this podcast from the beginning and in order. Thanks so much for listening. Well, greetings and welcome forward, everybody. I'm here with Stace, as usual. This is our 50th episode. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I, it's a 200th. Now, I, I, I would be in unbelievable territory at four or 500, I think. I mean, this is entirely <laughs> predictable to me. Um, <laughs> Oh my God! Okay, well, I'll remember I said incredible at fifty, and uh, <laughs> what a silly thing that was. Yeah. <laughs> well, I feel like fifty. There should be some like commemorative gold watch or something. Yeah. Something you have to do something at fifty. I don't know what it is, but surely there's yeah, something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're going to be um, summarizing some um, relational space stuff that we've covered so far. If you're not listening to the episodes in order as instructed, if you're a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> or a reasonable um, recipient of the teenage consciousness of the United States. And <laughs> when somebody says you can't do something, that gives you a motive to do the opposite. Yes. I understand. But if you start with this episode, round number that it is, you'll be very confused if you didn't do the last few. Yeah. So, um, and then we're going to get to the most problematic of all relational spaces and probably address why that is. Mm-hmm. Um, sexualized intimacy at some point, possibly mm-hmm. today, maybe today. We'll see. Yes. Okay. Well, let's um, let's recap a headline here and go a little bit further into it. Maybe um, all of identity's fairly radical pictures of things um, pivot on the fact that whoever the I is and the thou is. In any relational space, identity starts with the relational space with two as the most basic. We have a relationship with ourself also, but that's a little bit um, more uh, of a different topic. But we're gonna—I want to finish it up with it today. Relationship with ourselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, uh, in any I-thou situation, self and other, what makes identity so um, uh, different is that it holds that. All of our I, thou, or self and other relational space, whether it's with two or 200 or 2,000 or 200,000 or 2 million, are all the I, the self and the other are both up to two thirds to three quarters um, are inauthentic, emotively inauthentic selves doing all our relationality. Now that, that bears again repeating um, Mm -hmm. all of the theories about what human relational space is comprised of, how to transact it, what are the rewards, what are the risks, are all based on not knowing that two-thirds to three-quarter of the participants in any relational space in human intercourse um, are are wound-based versions of ourselves that distort and refract reality. Without that, you're going to get that, or without realizing that, all the theories about relational space and what comprises it and how to transact it are going to be distorted and refractive of a possible other reality that uh, when relational space is inhabited by emotively mature people. So, yeah, this, you know, this... re- related to this, it hit me a day or two ago reflecting on the, um, the, I've been thinking a lot about the, and applying this negotiating reality, uh, that relationality is negotiating reality. Right. The alternative <clears throat> is a word that has made me cringe since I was a teenager. 
and that is compromise. Oh yes, compromise. <laughs> and that's exactly what you just spoke to. If if you assume that both people are two thirds inauthentic, and that they're at least even if they're not, that there's a significant contribution each person has to distorting reality, then that's actually the premise that allows you to actually operationalize the negotiation of reality. Yes. If each person thinks their take on reality is undistorted and clear, well, yes. then you all you can do is compromise. Yes, that's exactly And how well right. does that work? Well, cue the current <laughs> news cycle, uh, right? Um, <laughs> oh, which, which part? <laughs> at virtually every version of it out there in the global internet world. Um, <laughs> so in, uh, as you say here, um, we don't, uh, we don't, stand for compromise in relational space between people we we um, we stand as joseph just said in negotiation and that negotiation pivots on a principle who in any moment of any relational transaction may have the less distorted version than the other mm -hmm. uh, i'd like to put it that way because yeah. it keeps everyone humble rather than say yeah. who's got the clearer one, you know? Right. Because, you know, one moment of brilliant truth is the, you know, followed by the next moment of absolute uh, distortion. And I also want to insert that the other corollary phrase that has always made me crazy is let's agree to disagree. <laughs> oh my God, Mike's going to claw my face off. And it took me a long time to realize why. It's because someone who really cares about truth would never say that unless. Yeah. It's a situation where, you know, it's business or it's some practical, pra pragmatic matter where there aren't shared values and you can't impose that upon them. But uh, uh, that idea of agreeing to disagree, like, yeah, let's all agree to disagree and never find out what the truth is, is sort of the parenthetical um, yes. following. And that, bear, and that bears a little focus right there. What you said, Joseph, it just occurred to me um, that Edenists... And we're proud to call ourselves uh, Edenists because everything is an ism. Uh, mm -hmm. Every everything, every paradigm is an ism, no matter uh, how uh, certain paradigms refuse to acknowledge that. Uh, we, in in identity, we look for the truth of transaction. We're looking always at the transactional truth, not upholstered distortions. And what that really means is, if we don't do that. Um, all we've got is people's relative comfort and discomfort levels compromising <laughs> all the time. Oh, my God. Yes. Right? Right. right. Mm -hmm. if, if there's no standard of object objectivity, then all we've got is complete relativity. And where's the benchmark to to where we negotiate? Well, my reality, I'm a better debater. I, I can I can uh, um, uh, make my needs more clearly known than than my partner. Or Why not? That's how our legal system is structured. And and the legislative branch, it's whoever can make the better argument wins. Right. Isn't that how it goes? <laughs> that's that's what it's reduced to. And yeah. most people don't think think re, or we're so conditioned into the into the compromise um, based on the fact that we think that we're not refracting or distorting reality that the whole this is why relational space is is such a a, a disaster zone for mm -hmm. humans because there's no agreed upon benchmark of what the point of relational space is it's about it's a the point of relational space for identity is to unpeel coverings to what really is true going on between two or more people. What's really going on? And for that, we need a benchmark. And there is no benchmark anywhere. All there is is communicative um, bluffing and communicative distortions where the relationship is reduced to how we communicate, not who we are, who we are, right? And so that benchmark is, um, by default, we're all two thirds at least. We'll, we'll we'll go with the least today. I'm in a good mood. Uh, we're we're <laughs> all at charitable. Least, <laughs> yes, uh, we're, we're all at least two thirds un unhealed, unconsciously wounded versions of ourselves every minute of every day, even in our dreams. Even though our dreams try to tell us something about uh, our our dreamy factor while we're awake. To me, it's funny you should mention that. I had a dream last night that I couldn't see while I was driving and drove over a cliff. And as I fell 
Um, I wasn't sure if I was driving off a cliff or not until I felt the negative G's and my, my stomach go up in my throat. Uh -huh. And then I was sure that I was about to die. And I woke up saying, God, help me. Wow. That's interesting. There's an interesting relational space between you and God there. We could uh, deconstruct. Yeah, there's right? a dream about losing control, I think. <laughs> I think I think that's probably accurate. At any rate, uh, what, what we've got here is, um, in that sense, all of us are walking around as uh, in a dream, two-thirds fogged up into who and what we are and who and what life is all about. So without that basic basic insight, any theory about what, what comprises or how to guide us in, in, in transacting relational space is going to carry those same refractive distortions. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing to say about relational space except what it isn't in many ways for identity because we can't discover what real relational space is until we become human beings with the reverse percentage, about two thirds um, emotionally authentic and clear, and uh, with two thirds of our unconscious wounds healed, um, and then one third not. That, that's the best any of us can do, at least at this stage. Identity doesn't uh, pie in the sky 100% recovery. Um, and this is why uh, identity does very little to no work, quote, on the relationship, because it doesn't yeah. see, it sees that as derivative of the individuals involved. And if it's not working. It's either because the people are not supposed to be together or because one or both of them are distorting. Well, I guess both of them are distorting reality, possibly one more than the other. And that's what has to get addressed. That's what you're talking about. I just wanted to flesh out that whole communication thing, because mm -hmm. when I have been exposed to um, I've never actually done it in a couple, but, I've, you know, seen it on TV and heard people talk about it. It really perplexes me how the idea it's sort of like when I work with businesses people have this idea of like well I'm going to stay the same person and then the business will change <laughs> it's like no no I'm going to stay the same person and the relationship will improve okay well right. how's that going to work well I'll just change the way I communicate uh-huh right but on the inside you stay the same you just choose different words like wow right. I'm surprised anybody actually thinks that that will work yeah uh, it's a young planet um, that's mm. for sure but but um, there's there's another element of refractive distortion that we uh, I want to include in this conversation. It, first and foremost, we're we're all two thirds um, unhealed in our unconscious woundednesses from childhood, and one day soon here we'll do a whole specific um, a podcast series on 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 child rearing and parenting specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, why that is the case uh we'll make that case again but it, but as such um the, that's the primary distorter refractor but the other one is that we're all inculcated uh, and conditioned on the planet uh at the moment uh that uh, in an i think therefore i am orientation all oh, right of course right? and so that that alone we could take that factor separate it out and just and talk a long time how dualistic um, forms, I, I, this is this, this is not that, um, how that is a refractor of reality also, even though Descartes thought it was a clarifier of reality. <laughs> See? I and so, that. well, he wasn't enlightened. Um, and uh -huh. so uh, what happens is uh, when you, when you make a, this or that based um, reality of dualistic communication, dualistic thought, dualistic communication, words, etc. If you're operating that our deepest essence as, as beings are our I, our eyes and thou's are created by brain matter um, uh, 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 or been conditioned into us a certain way, then what you've got is a, a, a fishnet, as we've used this um, metaphor many times, trying to pick up water. Uh, it's not suitable. So when we're locked into, and I think therefore I am, uh, orientation, we have a double, a second layer of refraction and distortion because you can de-dualize and be, lose a little slavery to your mind. And all of a sudden, all sorts of things show up in, uh, in reality that weren't there before. It's just like a child. You know, a child, let's say an eight, seven or eight-year-old goes to the museum and looks at um, a master's painting um, let's say what's there's a um, the a girl on the per, pearl ear, earring who's that artist uh, uh, Van something he's uh, Van Gogh 
No, uh, Netherlands uh, Dutch uh, painter. At any rate, so let's say the ch a child, a seven or eight year old, goes and looks at uh, close up, looks at the um, Garona pearl, pearl earring, earring, which is a really compelling painting. Uh, she's going to see he or she's going to see colors and forms, and oh yeah, that's nice. Oh, what's her name? Something like this will come up. Um, whereas that's use that as a starting place for a dualistically limited um, uh, expression of um, of experience. Whereas uh, an adult, uh, especially an art critic, let's say an adult, uh, um, thirty years in in, the, in their thirties, looks at the same painting but sees brush strokes and sees um, the context for the golden rule that might be applied there in the artistic uh, format of the painting. It'll look uh, for shadings of uh, light that the light, child light. simply would not see. So many more details. It's the same with uh, when you're slave to a dualistic um, um, mind slavery orientation to life. You're going to miss all these subtleties that are in the God field that an either or, um, this or that, um, which is dualism, can't two things can't be the same thing. Um, two things can't occupy the same space. Two thoughts can't occupy the same space at the same moment. Inside and outside, this is always the case. But when you lose your slavery to the mind and you start uh, experiencing experience and processing experience without that dualistic um, fishnet, you see subtleties and 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 uh, beauties and shimmerings and all sorts of things that you didn't see before. So if you look, if you're having an argument with your beloved, back to uh, a re relational space here, and one is enlightened and the other one isn't, let's say, one is still in the thralls of dualism and uh, one and not, um, the one who is um, enlightened and not enthralled to dualism is at a huge disadvantage. And I say that not, and not the other way around, because the one who, who has got perceptual uh, nuances far more in their field than their, than their partner are going to be aware of track, can track things that the person, and this is not third eye now, just as strictly not a Wait, dualism. which person has the disadvantage? The one who is post dualistic processing of reality. Okay. All right. That's what I thought yeah. you said. I'm still yeah. just, my mind's still trying to get around it. Yeah. Yeah. And the disadvantage is because they're, they're just like the adult um, looking at the at a painting different than a child, they're going to see all sorts of nuances and flows that the other person does not see. When I was younger, uh, someone would a ask me uh, if you had all all, if you, in according to identity's point of view, if you would like to draw a spouse who was equal to you, uh, um, equal in depth in personhood healing, in sagehood healing, or sainthood healing, healing, I always had an immediate um, answer was it was sage, because uh, this is a disadvantage, a disability that I've had uh, mm -hmm. in trying to get close and intimate with people who are not enlightened. It does. It's not a judgment. It's just a discernment, and 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 my reaction to it can be healthy or unhealthy, um, but um, it's, it's a strict disadvantage because you can't make yourself known. There's limits to how you can make yourself known to other. For me to go to a a, a, a born again convention um, somewhere, uh, 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 and for me to try to be known in such a, a conclave or com community would be impossible. So in that sense, if you add those two together, and that's a whole separate topic, um, of course. But if you've got those how two How a nobody together, relates to a somebody? <laughs> yes. How does a no, well, yeah. How does a nobody in, in the parlance of the day and in, in mm. current East, Eastern teachings? Yes. Uh, everyone else is somebody through dualistic versions of themselves. And then there's this nobody definition, not strictly bound to only dualistic process of experiencing. Uh, processing of experience. Um, it, that's a nobody by comparison. Mm -hmm. So the point the point here is that we're all walking around um, basically like zombies um, relative to relational space until and unless we learn to go vertical in our healing based in a we feel therefore we are paradigm of 
I could say psychological healing. This is why our personhood, emotional body, and soul dharma is so different than all other psychologies out there, because none of them, none of them are based on that we're emotive beings, emoto soulful beings first, before we're ever um, willful, mental, or physical beings. So this is why relational space in, in the world of identity is so looked at so radically differently. We're looking at it through we feel, therefore, we are eyes, and that changes everything. <clears throat> and one of the things that it changes uh, is that is what we've talked about uh, in summary here again about victimhood. Is is that that if if there are two people in relational space who have been um, equally, let's say, healed of their let's let's go ideal. I'm in a good mood today. Uh, two <laughs> two reverse they reverse the percentages. Two people are in relationship who have. Um, healed two thirds of their unconsciousnesses, and uh, now they're negotiating reality like crazy. Um, and uh, as as they're doing as they're doing that, they have an an a both a they're closer in heart and more distant in energy. And this is a really important point. We'll get to and talk about more in intimacy. But once you've healed, reversed your authenticity percentages. Your heart uh, is the one that's leading the charge, and your energy is following following it just like it does structurally. Only now <laughs> we're transacting along the lines of that structure, and in that case, uh, uh, when you're negotiating reality with your partner, in this case, uh, you're never a victim to to anything they do, based on a really simple pr premise. Uh, and that is, we've mentioned this in other prod podcasts. It's not the 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 knife that, when it stabs us, that causes us pain. It's our nerves that cause our pain. The knife doesn't hurt us. Our mm -hmm. nerves hurt us. Now, of course, the the um, the knife is going places uh, it shouldn't go, and so of course it's starting the the um, experience. But our our pain is not caused by the stab knife, by the stabbing wound. It's our own nerves. Now, there's a the reason I mention that. It's not, it's more than just an intellectual point. There's a clue in that that we first have to take responsibility for how we feel, not what the other person is doing to us. And we've talked about this before: the triggering rather than the causing. In that sense. Uh, uh, two people or three or ten uh, in, in in any sort of group relational space, uh, if they've reversed their healing percentage, they're never victims of each other. And that allows for a processing of relational space that's so bloody different. And he, I'll, we'll act it out here a little bit, Joseph. So um, what you just uh, what you just said um, really triggered me. Uh, um, it seemed really cruel to me what you said, as opposed to, Hey, you asshole! What, what, what? Don't you care about what comes out of your mouth? The second one is where a person is fused to a reaction and makes the problem about the other person. The 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 former uh, there is you first say, "Wow, that really triggered me." I, I'm not sure if it hurt me. I have to keep feeling it. But what you just said triggered me and it reminded me a bit of um, how much my uh, my father. Uh, did sim said similar kinds of band or made his communication with me similar kinds of bandwidths. Now that starting from that place, oh, now the ball goes back to the other person who did said said something that triggered the first person, and they get to say, oh well, you know, um, something you said ten minutes ago that I didn't have a chance to talk to in the group really triggered me, and I think that's why I toned it that way. Now, there's a back and forth that simply is very rare to find in any sort of uh, um, uh, group interactions where people simply blame each other and uh, they're never corrected by the facilitator. Let's say it's a therapeutic group. They're rarely, rarely in my experience anyway, um, corrected by the, um, the, uh, uh, the, lead, the lead facilitator for the group. They simply say, well, well, how did that make you feel? How did that make you feel? But then what do you do with how does, how does that make you feel? Where does it come from? Now we're back to X-ray visioning, only heart visioning. What's the truth in relational transaction? 
And we have a benchmark, and that benchmark is what's emotively mature um, a relationship is only possible by emotive, emotively mature individuals. So in that sense, this is why it's so hard to get across the differences mm -hmm. in identity in relational space, because we come from a completely different place with completely different um, uh, uh, awarenesses and trackings of subtleties in the background than I think, therefore I am, or I am a brain, therefore I am, or I have a body, therefore I am, simply don't pick up. So I wanted to make sure that that was really clarified here before we move to intimacy, the most problematic and challenging of all. And of course, what you just portrayed, that would be the beginning of a conversation, not the yes, end of one. Exactly. And uh. it's not all heady. People might hear what I just said um, and go, wow, you're so intellectually watching the relationship rather than being in it. And uh, I only did the first uh, couple fourths and backs on that. Um, the whole point of, uh, of relational truth seeking is to sink into layer after layer of how you feel and have an assessment and a benchmark whether that feeling is a wound-based feeling or a non-wound-based feeling. That all, that's what keeps it from being all intellectualized in identities uh, processing groups, for example, because we're all looking for a truth and we all want people in ED, EBE groups want to learn the truth about themselves more than try to tell other people their truth about other people. It's about discovering our own truths, and we're, we're much more open to that once we've done a, a good share of vertical work uh, in our EBE uh, personal uh, track so we can do horizontal work of uh, relational space with others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, without that benchmark, without that benchmark of truth, as you brought it forward here today, uh, Joseph, we're all just looking for um, don't don't get don't uh, force me out of my comfort zones. I want to stay comfortable who I am. I want the, I want you to I want our relationship to change while I stay the same person I am. And of course, if you ask a thousand people if they care uh, more about truth than comfort, I think a lot of people would say because especially they they know that the, to to be on the cutting edge of consciousness is to care about truth. They know they're supposed to, quote, do the right thing. And so we know we're supposed to uh, make truth matter more than comfort. But um, when they don't, when things, yeah, they, they when don't live the, it, they don't yeah. live it. What, what's the expression when the chips are down? Yes. Um, uh -huh. When yeah, the chips are down. That's a whole yeah. other matter. That's another. We, we tell ourselves we lie to our we've been conditioned to lie to ourselves without knowing we're lying to ourselves unless we have an offset um, uh, um, uh, 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 soul spine to notice what our personalities are doing in any one moment. And that extra soul spine is brought into the conversation as we ensoul in personhood work in, uh, in identity. We literally bring the soul forward through from the rear to the front of the interface with with people in the world and that's what's why it's called ensoulment not enlivenment or enlightenment um, it's ensoulment once that soul is operating two-thirds uh, uh one-third two-thirds soul fold one-third still working on our stuff oh man what's possible uh, uh for the for love to enter this relational space soul to soul, not just heart to heart, but the, the heart of soul to the heart of soul, not the not just the heart to heart, which is the local version, can also has that local version of my, my particular personality uh, d experiences love this way, my partner uh, experiences it that way, where's our common ground? So in that way, um, it's one, one more uh, big headline that brings home from the meta our differences, the way uh, identity looks at relational spaces, a very simple one that seems counterintuitive to, at this moment to bring in, but I offer it applies. And that is that what people are conditioned to do is that if something feels bad, it means it is bad. <laughs> yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And if it's something feels good, it is good. Um, this is basically uh, infantilism. Uh, children, when children, that's the way they experience reality. If something feels good, it is good. If people, if kids don't feel good, it's not good. 
it's bad. So um, we, we, most human beings never outgrow that. And when they so when they start negotiating reality, well, that this is good because what you just said makes me feel good. Um, so therefore, it must be right or it must be good. This is just crazy. Uh, just bear with us a moment here. Joseph knows exactly what I'm talking about here. Uh, just because something feels good doesn't mean it is good. In our terms, um, a heroin addict feels good while they're um, um, uh, uh, with the angel, as they say, as Sarah McCall and uh, McLean. No, yeah, Sarah McLaughlin. McLaughlin. Yeah. Uh, 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 in the what's arms of the angel. In, in the arms of the angel. Yeah, P people think that's about an angelic being. <laughs> it's not. That song is about a person in a heroin uh, high. And the arms could be of, both. Well, could be both. <laughs> they yes, can go together. <laughs> they, people can put that in there. They're, they're, they they actually um, uh, uh, um, can uh, resonate. But she actually wrote that song relative yeah. to a, a heroin uh, addiction. So in that sense, um, something that feels good to you is actually pretty bad. And something that feels bad to you can be really good. Like there are uh, whole there are multi billion dollar industries based on exactly that: tobacco, pornography, uh, yeah. fast food. Exactly. Know. So without that simple insight, by default we're conditioned to stay children that way. We don't look at how what makes us feel bad in any moment is. So let's say a partner makes us feel really bad in the moment. Um, that doesn't mean that person is a villain or that they're bad for causing you to feel bad. You, We have to drop in vertically and look at why does that feel bad to me? Maybe it's good for me and a, a part of me is resisting and it's hurting my resistor. It's making my resistor saying it's bad. And that's the inauthentic part. So in that sense, another characterization of relational space transaction and identity is we do not hold it as adults that just because something feels good means it is good and something feels bad means it is bad. We have to go much deeper than those two because many times the um, inauthentic part of us will call a good, a, a bad thing for us good or a good thing for us bad. Without that distinction, um, then relational space gets gooped up another whole level um, where uh, we're always being triggered uh, into good and bad feelings as opposed to healthy and in unhealthy feelings was what we should be tracking, not whether they make us feel good or make us feel bad. We should be tracking what, what, it, what might be an unhealthy good or an unhealthy bad or a mature good and a mature bad. Yeah, That's a couple of years ago, I, the, I believe it was the very last Facebook debate I was in a couple of years ago was when somebody posted something like, you know, it said something like, at the end of the day, if it makes you feel empowered, then keep doing it. Something like that. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. And I just oh. couldn't resist. And so I just, I think I just asked a question and I got dogpiled on so fast. Like, I asked yeah. a question that was like, kind of for clarification, because, you know, okay, it's a bumper sticker, you know, do you mm -hmm. want to say more? And what about mm -hmm. this? And, uh, you know, it was sort of prodding a little bit at the weak, weak links in the chain in that statement. And, uh, yeah, I got uh, I got really dogpiled on by like uh, a dozen people who really wanted to keep believing that. And that's a, uh, related to and a symptom of the extreme subjectivistic environment in which we live, because the individual's perception has never been more important in the history of consciousness. Therefore, how the individual feels has never been more important. Therefore, well, if it feels good, then it feels good. And who, you don't get to question that. Right. No, that that's such a classic uh, black hole of um, of ignorance. Uh, that empowerment uh, could be completely compensatory, covering mm. wounds. And so, uh, at the end of the day, if you feel empowered, maybe your control feels empowered. Maybe your narcissism feels empowered. Um, there's there's not that fine lens. Thanks for bringing that forward. And there's another distinction I'll sometimes use in talking about this, where we we get somewhere in human history, we got at the level of the physical body, that physical discomfort yes. can be um, bad or it can be making you stronger. That's what exercise yeah. is, right? Right. And you, know, you put someone on a bike who's never exercised before, you know, they'd be like sweating and all red and breathing hard, but like this feels terrible. I got to stop. And we would say, no, that's how you know it's working. 
You know, yeah. like this is actually good for you. And if you study a lot, like if you're learning a foreign language and living in a foreign country, your brain hurts at the end of the day. It gets tired. But mm -hmm. the emotional level, mm -hmm. we don't make a distinction between what is emotional, emotional pain that's good for us versus emotional pain that's bad for us. Right. And how, how do we tell the difference? Right. No benchmark out there currently, even in, philo in philosophy or psychology or any spirituality. Uh, there's no there's no um, orienting rubric that we can reduce uh, our symptoms to a principle. And that's what identity framework is. It has all these principles and you're you're free to uh, disagree with them if you like to don't believe anything we're saying here uh, again. Uh, stick with what you're doing until it doesn't work for you anymore. Nice point. And last but not least, um, one last uh, headline we can move on to intimacy. And that is to remind us all again and again and again that every relational space is co-created. Every relational space is co-created. Um, and the simplest way to say it is um, when you were negotiating reality, <laughs> negotiating truth, uh, whether it's a toxic truth or a mature truth, uh, we, in the simplest way, we, we would say in identity, we must take 100% responsibility for our 50%. Mm -hmm. In other words, in the end, even though in any moment someone's toxic um, contribution to the uh, co-creational index is higher than the others. It goes back and forth in intimacy a lot. Sometimes one person will have a little less toxicity to their truth than the other. And then, and then, then it all has to be sussed out and and, and distilled down. But in the, in the end, uh, if we stick with a, I have to take 100% responsibility for my 50%, then I'm always with that little aphorism, I'm always on my side. I'm always on my side of the relationship first checking about my premises, checking my experiences, my experience toxic, to being toxically distilled through my uh, some unconscious wound, or is it really being reflective of my greater soulful being? So in that sense, uh, we only would make anything about the other person first that's caused us some distress or positive either way. Uh, I, I was with um, a person, a woman uh, once where our relationship um, uh, I I, w I felt so much love transacting in the relationship, and it, it, I one day I was horrified to realize that this person had um, a steel cage around their heart, a steel plate around their heart, and all the love that I was experiencing was bouncing off that person's heart and coming back to me. And I was simply feeling my own love mm. coming back at me. It was being mirrored back to me very skillfully by the protector of the of the woman in that case. Mm. And so in that sense, uh, I was completely bamboozled. Um, and and if the fact I had to look at how could I not tell that difference? In other words, it would be easy to say, oh, Stace, that, that must have been really hard to realize that woman wasn't letting in your love. Well, yeah, but staying on my side in this example, taking 100% of my 50%, how could I have missed that? The only way I could have missed it is if I had my own lockout of my own heart in the transaction in some domain that matched hers, or else I would have noticed it within 24 hours of our beginning of love exchanges. So, in that sense, we take response when we say take a hundred percent of your fifty percent. It always comes back to a non-victim place, and it reminds me of what Yeshua meant by turn the other cheek. Mm. <laughs> uh, remember, uh, we've said this before. I think it was not That's about so turning good. your other cheek to be struck again by your foe in that moment. It's after you've been slapped. Turning the other cheek means, why didn't I see that coming? You come, That's what Jesus taught. Before you strike back an eye for an eye uh, um, until the whole world is blind, as Gandhi said, and a few other people, not just Gandhi said that, um, an eye for an eye until the whole world is blind, uh, which is Judaism is basically based on that, uh, a completely still to this day, conservative Judaism, uh, and Christianity to a large degree. 
So turn the other cheek is, what? why didn't I see that coming? How did I not discern that all the love that felt so good to me was my own? It was like one of those shiny uh, shields that are so are burnished so shinily, the sunlight comes right back at you, back into your eye. Uh, so in that sense, our uh, one of our transactional principles is take 100% responsibility for your 50%, and you'll never get stuck in victimhood in a very simple uh, um, uh, formulative way. So I think that about, I just wanted to touch base with those simple principles that that, that govern uh, relational space. Uh, simple, but not easy to embody. Sure. No. Oh my God. Uh, so, so difficult. So, all right, let's, let's, um, let's see, would it be downshifting, Joseph, or, or upshifting to go to um, uh, uh, intimacy? It's just a meta, it's just a car metaphor. It doesn't matter. Okay. All right. <laughs> yes, shift. Of course, we're going to shift. Yeah, we're going to shift. Okay. Um, so basically, um, one of the things that identity wants to say about intimate relationships, that is when sexuality is uh, included in it, whatever that uh, transaction, which we'll get to here uh, in the next couple of uh, podcasts, whatever domain it involves. Um, basically, we're talking about um, the difference between lust and love mm. is one of, one of the spotlighted issues here. In other words, we're talking about... Um, in, I, in the ideal benchmark of relational, intimate relational health, uh, it is a confluence and no uh, uh, all confluent, resonant of confluence between the second and fourth chakra themes in one person and second and chakra theme, sec, second and fourth chakra themes in the other person. And since none of us have innate Women have more of innate an innate connection between four and two than men, driven by our dumb sticks as we are uh, in many ways. Um, but uh, just because women have a more innate capacity for it doesn't mean they transact their their second and fourth in communion with each other. Uh, they've learned from men men who separate two and four. Uh, sexually, sex, sex and love. Men can have sex all day long innately without including love, much more so than women if they are honest with themselves. And I'm saying mm -hmm. a lot of um, uh, um, uh, feminists have been reconditioned by feminism to split their two and four, uh, uh, um, take, take ownership of their sexuality. Right, right. You should. You should have been all along. But as soon as you um, uh, start uh, leaving love out of the transaction, you basically reduced a 40-year-old woman or a 30-year-old woman to her teen years when she should have gotten yeah. that done in the teenage years. Who, not who takes ownership of their sexuality, right? <laughs> gold or green. Right, right. Yeah. Gold, gold meaning our soulful, authenticated self, and green, uh, the one who, our inauthentic version. So in that sense, lust, lust is the added um, component uh, which makes uh, um, uh, an intimate relationship different than a friendship. That's very simple, but we got to start with the simple building blocks here. So lust, of course, um, what we have been conditioned that lust is a bloody sin. It's even one of the seven uh, sins in uh, in Christianity. I um, I think also uh, um, well, it's re it's re in regard it's um, referenced in the Ten Commandments by Moses for the Mosaic tradition of Judaism. Uh, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Oh right? yes, I never thought about that as lust. Yeah, yeah of course. Mm -hmm. it's all it, the lust is a sin when it's it, it, basically the providence is this: lust is a sin in sex unless it's making a child. Uh, oh, if it's God. not make if it's not making a child. Then lust, you're on a gray zone there with lust because then you're just using your wife, and we'll stick with a man at the moment. You're using your wife for your own satisfaction if you're not going to make a baby. There's at least a third thing happening uh, in there. Because you're not you, serving the glory of God and making more beings to worship it. Exactly right. Yeah. To this day, that's still true in Hasidism. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, where on Friday, every Friday night, uh, they, they it's mandated they make love and uh, what? Yeah, Hold every on a fr second. Friday night on the sh <laughs> Friday night before the Shabbat starts on Saturday, right before Sabbath, 
Um, that's when you get the dirty stuff out of the way and you make babies on Friday nights. Um, um, that's when sex is. It's mandated. Now, if, if, a, if a Hasidic couple wants sex more often, that's fine, but it's mandatory um, on uh, Friday nights, believe it or not. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I, I, you go ahead and look it up. I'm uh, Googling this. <laughs> good for you. You do that. We're talking about the most strict forms. Of course, Hasidism is uh, is um, the most conservative version of Judaism, uh, and it's what it came after World War II, after the Holocaust, what they call the Holocaust, uh, where mi- over five, six million uh, Jews were were um, killed by Nazis. Uh, and in that case, they uh, uh, they were the Hasidism is about going backward before the um, the Holocaust to live not so much in the presence of a loving God, but just all duty. Everything is duty and continuity and um, and principles, not actually alive living. All right, well, I found something here that corroborates this. It's just, I can't even pronounce the name of the site. It's some Orthodox Jewish site, and it says, uh, marital relations are one of the pleasures of Shabbos, and it is therefore a mitzvah to establish one's minimum ona, I don't know what ona is, ona obliga- obligation to uh-huh. occur on the Shabbos and intend to fulfill the mitzvah of oneg Shabbos by doing so. Yes. Um, so it's an auspicious time for intimacy, Friday night, mm-hmm. and a person is obligated to love his wife and be intimate with her. I did not know this. Wow. <laughs> Where yeah. did you hear about this? Well, um, the Hasidic uh, uh, tradition was always fascinating to me huh. because um, they they were so um, atavistic. They're so out of touch with modern reality. And I, I wanted to know what that extra element was, mm-hmm. uh, the, the, like the communities in Williamsburg and New York and in, in the Bronx, uh, when so many of um, the Holocaust survivors uh, decided to uh, want to repopulate the, and the, that literally part of the Hasidic uh, situation is we have to replace those five or six million who yeah. were killed in the Holocaust. That's why um, a, a Hasidic wife is um, denied. Uh, her orgasm, for example, is irrelevant. She is a mama machine. Mm-hmm. Uh, many of these uh, marriages are arranged uh, uh, by by the parents, most of them, not 90 percent of them. And uh, the the girl, a young girl, is raised uh, not anything about a healthy sexuality, only subservience to the patriarchal man uh, in the in the relationship. And her duty is to repopulate the Jew the Jewish population to make up for the Holocaust. So a lot of these girls at eighteen, by the time they're twenty five or twenty seven, they have six or seven kids. They're just mama machines. They're not allowed to have any job. In the outside world, hmm. they a lot of them are not even allowed to read uh, the Torah uh, um, in that sense. So oh, it's God. it's an atavistic system that, um, in one way, it's really sly. And I'm only using this as an example. It acknowledges that you just looked there um, that lust is reasonable in service of um, the marriage of love between the husband and the wife. But the husband and wife are not equal. They've never been equal in Hasidism. I mean, even in even in progressive in Jerusalem, there's still <laughs> women can't be at the same wailing wall as men. Oh, I know. I still I, remember vividly as a teenager. I went to a um, a wedding that was the couple was not Orthodox or even conservative, but the temple in which they got married was on the conservative side, and they had that uh, sheet down the middle of the room and yes. the husband and wife are up on chairs and they're holding the piece of cloth between the two of each other. Like they, they can't even, I don't understand that the whole thing is about union and we're going to celebrate their union by dividing the men and women on two sides of the temple. And they're, you know, I mean, there's a poetry I get to like being on the other end of a towel or whatever, but like it's supposed to be about union. I don't get it. Well, again, uh, these traditions, um, uh, uh, people, younger souls get attracted to these religions because that's stable and predictable and they've got strong do's and don'ts. It's all at the level of behavior, not at the level of intention or motive. Um, And the deck is stacked completely patriarchally in Hasidism, worse than any other um, sect of Judaism that I know. Well, Yang's far more comfortable with rules, aren't they? So Um, if it's going to be a rules-based paradigm, then the men are going to rule that automatically, I guess. 
Absolutely. And arranged marriages 90% of the time. Now, I'm not picking on Judaism for any other reason other than I'm bringing an example. There's plenty of stuff to um, reflect uh, uh, on the vagaries of most uh, dark age based religions. But they, uh, by definition, they're not allowed to evolve. Because if they evolve, then they're betraying God or betraying a scripture or um, the Pope to this day says um, we can't negotiate reality with modern times. Um, what? It is, yeah, yeah. No, we can. We reality can. is modernity, <laughs> and modernity is reality. No, 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 no. Um, we, 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 we have to be the stronghold and not just uh, sell out our catholic truths um, for the modern sensibilities of humankind, um, especially the secular ones. Uh, yeah. So. It's like it reminds me of like with the um, the Amish. It's like somehow God decreed that the exact right amount of technology is what we had in like 1885. And that amount of technology is right. But no less and no more. You just freeze it right there. Yeah, right. So the point being here is there's enough uh, uh, um, derision, uh, uh, respectful derision uh, uh, about uh, religions being stuck uh, 2,000 to 3,000 years ago and traditions and principles. But the idea here is that in an, in an emotively mature or an identities version of intimacy, uh, second chakra and fourth chakra um, dynamics, love and sexuality, are so fraught that that axis between second and fourth chakra themes, that axis is basically the, the garbage dump for almost all of what we don't, uh, where what we don't get provided in childhood, goes to um, uh, down into those buckets, love and sex. Uh, the the love is going got wound based versions all the way down to core on worth, and the sex um, is all about um, either putting distance between you and sex or overdoing it or underdoing it. What's the sweet spot here? How does how do love and sex find their abeyance and abidance with each other? It's impossible, uh, identity would offer, if the transaction is between two people who are both two thirds unconsciously wounded uh, um, and uh, don't know it, and they're operating in their inauthentic selves. Two and four, I, it's accidental sometimes that chemistry uh, might give a great sex life but unless they had perfect childhoods, such a couple um, are going to have their heart closed to some degree because they never learned, never got enough heart food in childhood to ever have it substantive enough to learn how to link it to second chakra. Mm -hmm. So in that case, um, even when there's chemistry and the sex works great uh, between two people, uh, doesn't mean that it's a healthy second chakra bond, uh, mediated bond in that moment. Because unless you've been cleared your heart of its unconscious conditions, you're going to have to go out of your heart and concentrate on sexual energy, which is not hard for we're, we're primed and pumped, pumped to do it, so to speak. Uh, our genetics, our genetics um, and our, our hormonal uh, surges and, and wanings are all part of the, the body. But how do we manage them when we're all, all of us arrive at our sexual activity age, whether that's 14 or 15 for lots of people nowadays, or it's 20 or 21 or even later, and, and back in our generations, Joseph, my, mine further than yours, um, except it was the 60s, so that doesn't count right. <laughs> for me. But in that sense, um, uh, uh, we're all bereft and forth. And what's going to happen is the, the other element in, in, in parenting is if we don't get met by the emotively, so, emotosophical, authentic, authentic versions of our parents, they're going to template to us a way of being that's not going to allow us to healthfully connect through first chakra to the earth. In other words, mm. um, if we're if we're not shown in our first relational space, which is the relational space with our parents, if we're not shown how to be soulful beings, uh, felt or felt in our in our rela realities, um, disciplined gently when needed, um, uh, um, all the things that go into what EBE would say or what identity would say is emotively mature parenting. Without that. Our first, second, and fourth chakras are going to be um, garbage dumps for what didn't happen, resulting in our third chakra of personal power taking too much space 
and fifth chakra are, are, are taking too much will, taking too much space, where our personal I and our will, third and fifth, are going to be at play in, in relational space. So I know that all sounded a little um, complicated, but the idea here is what is the real relationship between lust and love? How can we actually find it? And identity wants to start this conversation in a very basic uh, foundation that you can't unless you become an emotively mature being first. Now, that doesn't mean um, we're not supposed to do intimate relationships until we become emotionally mature. All identity says is, oh, in the modern day, because it's possible now, try not to have kids before you're emotively mature, at least. You're not, you're, we're going to have sex for sure before we're uh, emotively mature. But boy, if there was any way that uh, the, the world would wake up to the fact that we're not qualified to be parents until we become emotively mature, that would change generations to come, just that one shift. So in that sense, uh, because all the chakra themes are, are damaged and, and or inhibited or uh, compensating uh, for our wounds in childhood, uh, uh, second and fourth, sexual love versus lust tends to kind of uh, dominate the conversation. Uh, of course, a bully, a, a man who's a bully and, be and, and, and beats his wife, uh, of course, has third and fifth chakra stuff going on. But, but in our topic of, of intimate relationship and what could be, not what is right now, uh, this, we start the discussion off with what's healthy sexual energy and what's healthy love energy. Without starting there, uh, we're going to get into a real morass about that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a there's actually a woman um, I want to shout out to um, uh, uh, an author. Uh, what's her name? Uh, Sarah something. Sarah Beak. Um, she's got a, a book a series. Uh, she's her whole um, teaching ages is um, red, hot, and holy. Uh, it's a great phrase. I love that phrase, red, hot, and holy. Um, she she uh, stumps for the fact that uh, sex is not bad; uh, it's healthy and holy. Uh, and this this is a good message for basic uh, people who haven't realized this earlier, like religious people or, or people who had really dysfunctional sexual bandwidths in their childhood or their homes. Uh, that sex that sex is actually holy in many ways that she puts into secular uh, expressions. So she's got she's got a target audience for those who are ashamed that that, that, that have been taught to um, de-link sex and spirituality. And for that, I congratulate her. Mm -hmm. uh, she's got a, a lot of people who could who could who need to listen to what her message is. Now, different different uh, audience than what identity uh, is talking to, but still a really great uh, place to start. So in that sense, um, uh, the biggest repressor of sex as spiritual um, in the West is, of course, Western religions. Islam takes that to a ridiculous lengths. Uh, Catholicism is next worst. Um, uh, Christianity, uh, evangelical Christianity is the next worst. Um, uh, but um, sex and spirituality are, are at two ends of the religious or the spiritual spectrum for, for most uh, old dark age religions. Uh, we could we've taught, referred to all the time uh, in these podcasts about the distortions and the patriarchy uh, that yeah, we fills in the that. space. Well, it yeah. doesn't get much more human than sex. And mm -hmm. if, if religion is anti-human, it has to be anti-sex, doesn't it? Oh, very nicely said. Uh, in that sense, you're exactly right, because identity would say that um, sexual, sexual bandwidths of energy are the most dense versions of, of dense ener of energy uh, for human beings. Mm -hmm. And they have to be that dense because second chakra genital um, interaction is what is creates um, uh, uh, human beings. So that ha really has to be overloaded with dense energy and uh, the lust end of it tends to overwhelm the love end of it in most people only because we're all starving in, in fourth. Uh, from childhood. We don't know we're starving. If our parents told us they loved us 20 times a day and be the best person you can be and we support you no matter what you do, all that can happen. All that can be conditioned in the relational space verbally and energetically by parents who have no idea how to raise what children need. 
Um, so if we've been conditioned energetically and verbally and mindfully, uh, we a lot of people think we've had ideal uh, uh, childhoods. Well, think again. Um, if you had an ideal childhood where your parents really did um, could give you all the emotional, soulful, heart food you, you needed, you would not be having those problems in relationships. You would you would automatically know your passion path in life, basically. Um, you would be healthy. You'd never use dr um, drugs recreationally past a certain point of um, experimentation to see what's up going on there. You wouldn't be uh, polyamorous. You wouldn't, um, you'd, you'd want second and fourth uh, together. It would be together by the time you were in your 20s or early 30s. So if you haven't had all those things um, come to you, you didn't have a perfect childhood. Sorry, sorry to pop your bubble here, but um, sexual energy tends to um, become the hotter topic, so to speak, <laughs> because we're all starving in heart. Mm -hmm. And so that's how identity starts the conversation. So in that sense, until we can heal our heart from our childhoods um, and our cultural and religious conditioning, societal conditionings, we're not gonna be able to find enough power in four to match the energetic power in two. So it's going to it's going to tend to fill the space either. And then you're going to relate to that dense, powerful space out of second chakra themes, uh, either by over over managing it or under managing it. It's going to fall somewhere in that rainbow of that. But it's still going to be it's still the center of things if you're over managing it. No, you can't have sex before marriage. No, um, uh, sex is only for procreation. No, if it's lust alone, well, you're a shallow person. Whatever it is that um, we've been conditioned with in our cultures and society, um, sex fills the space uh, whether or not we're talking about it or not. That's a really interesting idea. Like in a far more healed world, if we just wave a magic wand and say, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, two thirds of people are emotionally mature by whatever measure, then there'd be as much talk about love as there was sex, yes. or maybe more. Maybe more, that's exactly right. But uh, the, the whole idea of sexuality, um, only, re only really in, in America anyway, became part of, of, the, of the more um, uh, mass consciousness conversation on the outside by the 60s. Where all the all the conformity that uh, happened after the horrors of two world wars, um, all of a sudden we're in the Reagan era in this country and uh, and Eisenhower and then uh, then Nixon and then uh, um, Reagan, uh, oh we can finally relax and so the conformity ruled the roost there post those two world wars. And it was the 60s, my generation, that broke it all out and said, um, as if they were inventing the orgy or something, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, Rome they, called, they want their uh, invention. Uh, yes, they, they want their, <laughs> their patent. Uh, we all we yeah. open the Roman orgies, right? The only difference is uh, that we, uh, most of the time, that, uh, my generation didn't um, also include overeating and vomit vomiting with their orgies. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, God, yeah. what kind of orgy doesn't have overeating? It's a binge yeah. eating and purging. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Never oh catch me at that kind of orgy. I want right. the full orgy. Right. <laughs> so uh, uh, out of the '60s, broke into the broke the conversation out into the to the horror of most of mostly white folks uh, in this country. Anyway, um, the horrors of, of open talk about sex. My parents were an were a, um, a, a an oddity. My mother was hypersexual um, and and had a created an over-sexualized household in our, in our world, mostly as a, as a form of joking and, um, and, and the only way she knew how to get people to laugh and things, uh, mm. bless her heart. But um, uh, we, I, I grew up in the exception, but most, most, most of my friends, <laughs> most of my friends would, uh, in high school, would always want to come over to my house after school because they wanted to hear Mrs. B. Mrs. <laughs> Uh, especially by the time we got to be juniors in high school, oh, I had five or six guys. You got to, you got to meet Mrs. B. So she'd be wait, waiting with her cup of coffee at three thirty or quarter to four. We got back from the Catholic high school, and uh, and she would start out, oh well, who's this? Uh, who's this guy? And oh, this is Jeff. Uh, I just he's in one of my classes, and he wanted to meet you. Really? Why? Well, he just heard some things about you, and my mother would pick it up right there, and she'd go, well, well, 
uh, so Jeff, this past weekend, uh, did you get blown? Uh, <laughs> I knew you, you know, were going to say that yeah, somehow. Yeah, this <laughs> past weekend, she she was just absolutely uh, filterless um, wow. in that way. And so, of course, uh, rip roaring. Uh, I, I would at first I cringed, and then mm -hmm. eventually I compensated and got along with the program, yeah. so I could be popular with the, some friends that way. Sure. Right? Yeah. I, what what can I do? I was as impressionable as anyone else in high school. Yeah, a little different domain, but still. So in that sense, the the sixties brought the whole thing open. There wouldn't be a modern feminism uh, without the sixties breaking open and challenging standards and modes of behavior. So that whole conversation about how how to integrate sex, the energies of sexual energy, with the energies of love that uh, and forth which are backed up by soul, equally powerful, but underutilized because we've never been shown how to live as emoto soulful beings, only fleshy beings, mental beings, willful beings, uh, but not emoto soulful beings. Yeah, and the, the proof that the um, excess sexuality hasn't scratched the heart itch is that the free love of the 60s has echoed forward into art and entertainment and music where it's just rippled outward and gotten bigger and bigger and bigger modern music doesn't even use metaphor for sex anymore it's like mm -hmm. graphically described where <laughs> it used to be you know the word rock could be used as a synonym for having intercourse and now yeah. it's just like graphically described and it, it, it's denuded of any kind of mystery or Exactly. Um, interpretation. It's, it's really it's, coarse. It is. And in, 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 in those domains, it's the art, the pendulum has swung all of the other mm. way. Right. Uh, but in that sense, um, if uh, when we're in soul, it's a different bandwidth than and forth than it is with two. But there's equal power and they're meant to cohabitate. And if you think of it that way, two and four are separated by three. None of us have a healthy eye. Uh, in our hara, in our third chakra, in our bellies. And so that's going to obstruct two and four talking to each other because you've got uh, an unhealed um, uh, sense of, uh, foundation of eyehood uh, in, in, the, in your belly. So in that sense, um, the conversation of sex now has broken out uh, in a whole lot of different directions. Uh, the only thing in the past that had anywhere near a, a teaching about the sacredness of sex was, of course, Tantra, which is a uh, an esoteric uh, form of Hinduism um, mm -hmm. that uh, meant to um, uh, uh, um, uh, sacredify, uh, sanctify in some way <clears throat> sexual energy. And but that's where it stopped. It was all energetic. It was all flow. It was all downstream transaction of energy, not upstream motive or intention for the energy. So if you just start with an intention, I want to I want to become tantrically evolved. Well, yeah, you, you can learn it. Um, you can learn it. They tell you to sink in into into energies, but not into core emotions. Tantra, of course, was very old, 2,000 to 3,000 years. A little, Some of it's a little more than 3,000 years, if I remember right, yeah. uh, in that sense. And uh, there was, it was a pre-psychological age, so there was no such thing as the unconscious. So all we had was conscious energies, conscious intentions. So we could get energy flow going in Tantra with, our, with, a, with a decision. Uh, I will use my willful body to sink into feeling energies and try to feel how there is some sort of uh, something beyond just physical lust that when you add a spiritual component, even the physical lust gets um, much more rewarding, uh, orgasmic, uh, satisfying or whatever. But the limitation is, and of course, and Tantra is still going on these days, uh, the limitation, just like with yoga, is um, is about energy flow not heart flow, not love flow, not in the way they mean it when they say it um, uh, in yoga or in Tantra. And that, so, that energy stuff, is that like the top of the fourth chakra or sixth chakra? Where is that getting transacted? Um, we could say that uh, energy, uh, identity is a very strict metaphysical um, sequence here. Energy is downline, downstream of what we call I-core or the 
what what life is made of, what God is made of, love, I core, the blood of the gods. Um, it, energy is only the secondary movement of I core or I coric dynamical bandwidth into motion. So there's something deeper than energy, which is why uh, the modern day that says uh, I am energy, therefore I am. It's uh, um, it's not bad, but uh, there's st it's still way downstream of the quality of the divine uh, young, uh, love substance of everything, everything. And you can the soul automatically swims in those ichoric waters. But when we're we come here, because our parents are not soulful, our religions don't really they talk about soul, but they don't show us how to be soulful, except to believe in a divine being instead of partake of a divine being. Um, we're we're blind as bats in this domain. So energy, it's ichor in motion without the ichor. Uh that's what energy is in identity. It's ichor in motion without the ichor. So our third like show the, the ripples of the pond, not the rock that is the essence of it is that a decent metaphor or what no uh i would that's that's, that's pretty decent um um we could say that uh a better one is uh icor is the still water and uh ah, the, the wave, wave is wave, the energy uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah exactly right mm -hmm. and so um icoric energy vibrates but doesn't move or flow it vibrates but then it becomes energy, and that's fine. But we, we've never been taught to recognize the difference between the downstream energetic form of i -Core and the upstream stillful form of i -Core, uh, in that way. So uh, that's why uh, just going with tantric energy um, is not the same as two hearts joining as deeply as two sets of genitals. Mm -hmm. Now, now think about that a moment. Um, we, of course, as humans, uh, didn't start doing ventral to ventral sex until um, a certain point in our, uh, our our evolution of consciousness. We mm. did um, a, a rear rear entry most of the time, and uh, even reverse uh, cowgirl is still part of that uh, um, uh, sexual orientation. Monkeys do that. Um, a monkey sometimes will do that, yes. Um, uh -huh. But they, most of the time, it's all from the rear. All from they don't the like rear. facing each other. Yeah. No, it's no. Uh, it's, so it's ventral of the man to the dorsal of the woman. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, they could talk about cisgender matings. And we'll be very careful. And not, we're not going to worry about pronouns in these podcasts. We're going to worry sensitivity to uh, cisgender and LGBTQIA pluses. Uh, we certainly will. We'll get to that. So ventral to ventral. Um, is when is of course the missionary position, uh, and uh, that's where um, uh, duh, four has a chance to touch just as deeply as twos are are being touched. Mm -hmm. So what does that? How do we decode that? What's the maximum we can do here? Uh, how do we maximize the depth of penetration and reception uh, that's happening in the genitals? With the heart chakra, uh, does the heart of a man uh, have different frequencies than the heart of a of a woman, for example? Is a is a good question to start with, um, and the and 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 is that true? Would identity say that's true? Well, only in downstream energetic perturbations, not at the essence. And we're talking about here, sex. Uh, when it's lust driven in the sensations in the genitals, of course. Um, this the the pleasure there is uh, co-created. Uh, hopefully, if uh, if neither has blocks uh, in their um, genital issues uh, that 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 leach out into the physical, it's a mutual pleasure. Even if women um, only three or four out of ten can orgasm uh, with. Uh, with penetration only, which is another whole. We'll we'll talk a lot. We'll be sexologists here also uh, in this uh, in this series. We'll, uh, we'll, we have no compunction about uh, talking very clinically about sex that way too. But look at the difference here. We've been uh, uh, pumping away, so to speak, uh, one way <laughs> uh, with second chakra dynamics, and sometimes uh, even uh, people uh, for generate for many thousands of years have also been doing anal sex. Uh, 
uh, uh, that way. It's not something we invented. Sorry, it isn't. Which is probably why the Greeks thought that large penises were like coarse and unattractive. They that's why, and all the statues are on the smaller side. Not good for yes. anal when it's really uh, thick. Not, not yeah, but especially if they're really thick. That's that's going to be cause <laughs> talk about oh. creating hemorrhoids. You know. Hey, uh, yeah. Oh, God. Uh, sidebar here. I read recently that I can't remember if it was in the last. 10 years i think it was the last 10 years yeah in the last 10 years that um penis length has been increasing 25 percent. did you hear about this i did i read you have about a, a, a <laughs> they're blaming it on hormones and stuff but what is does identity have a point of view on why this is happening and what it means well um the first place i went to when i saw this was mm, that's interesting to tell me the measuring uh, uh algorithm uh -huh. uh, uh, is it possible that there's a different measuring al algorithm now than there was 40 years ago or 50 years ago? I'm not. That's the first question. There's I not have. many. You can't have a measuring error of 25 percent. That's quite a margin margin of error. Well, um, the second place. OK, okay. point conceded. Second point, uh, point did, did they ask the male participants in this measure, uh, when they were, were measuring erect penises, did they ask them if they were on Viagra? Uh, <laughs> I doubt that they did. That would be too personal. So if a mm. man was going to go, well, they're going to measure my erect penis, I'm going to be the best man I can be here, and I'm going <laughs> to you know, drop a blue pill. So The, I, equi I mean, the equivalent of steroids. <laughs> yeah. I mean, measuring. That, the, the hardness factor that happens with Vi Viagra is one of these products um, yeah. adds, um, I'm not sure it adds 25%, but it adds girth and length and holds it there. Um, yeah. Almost so that it might, it might, it can hurt sometimes. Yeah. Uh, uh, so in that sense, I don't know. We, the, the jury's still out here. Is, is it possible um, because of the, so many, so many, so much in our food supply, it was the third place I went to mm -hmm. something in our food supply, the leakage of hormones uh, in from animal uh, uh, animals we eat. Uh, um, I'm not sure what what kind of intakes would account for that. But our dietary was the, the next place, as I said, I went to. But it's certainly possible um, that uh, uh, it, it, that's that's real. But I can't really uh, find any emoto spiritual no. reason of why that would be a good thing. Uh, oh, certainly not a good thing. Um, yeah. uh, especially longer, wider, maybe girthier. Yeah. That might be a good thing. But I don't think longer <laughs> is necessary. Um, but uh, yeah, if anything, I would have thought that they would be getting smaller because men yeah. tend to be carrying so much more yin and their yang yes. is um, repressed. And the uh, what you used to call the uh, the patriarchal asshole has been yeah. replaced by the sensitive patriarch, which is just as patriarchal, <laughs> only different yes. in expression. Yeah. So I would have thought that the, um, the the unification of most men would cause penises to shrink, not not increase in size. So, well, we could we could uh, uh, throw out some possible uh, uh, since you brought up the subject. Uh, it could be brought uh, it up. Yes, I <laughs> brought it up. So to speak. <laughs> uh, uh, it could be compensation for feminism. Uh, uh -huh. that could make some sense. Now, mm -hmm. remember that second chakra is not just lust themed, it's creativity. Mm -hmm. It's also creativity. We, we create human beings with the gen with our genitals, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, all of our creative impulses are also um, sexual, sexual in some way. There's, there's a linkage between creativity and sexuality, creativity. So it wouldn't surprise me if the um, the uh, 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 patriarchy wanted to resurge uh, um, uh, to make the, uh, the to reassert their dominance in respect to um, to compensate over feminism and the equality that way. Uh, wouldn't surprise me that that's possible. Uh -huh. I'm not sure it explains 25 um, percent, mm -hmm. but uh, I have I have this. Um, uh, idea that in in three years or two years they're going to say, hey, remember that in 2023, early 23, this came out. Well, here's here's what's turned out to be bogus about that. I uh -huh. just keep seeing that possibility, but I can't explain it right now. Yeah, no, nor well, would it would be the first thing to be redacted, like you know that <laughs> yeah. butter is bad for you, and you know every other right. thing. Sugar is a good alternative for high fat things, and every exactly. other thing that changes eggs, egg you know egg yolks, egg whites, all that. So yeah, it'll probably change. All right. Um, thanks for the sidebar. That was interesting. Yes. Uh, so back to the main point here um, is that uh, the whole um, we're not overestimating here when we when identity talks about 
uh, the po- importance of two and four to create satisfactionally mature uh, intimate bonding. There wouldn't be a rom-com if they were so- all settled in. There'd be no such thing as a rom-com movie. Uh, the whole idea of rom-coms is how do they, what, how, how do you, where do you measure attraction? Is the attraction all sexual? Is it, is it, what's happening between us here? How do we negotiate? I want, I want sex more immediately than my, my new partner possible wants it. And how do we negotiate all those funny uh, domains, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the fact that there are rom-coms means we don't have a clue (laughs) how to do two two and four dance. Uh, Because we're entertained by people who are confused and negotiating it. And yeah, that we're like, oh yeah, I can relate to that. That's what you're saying. Exactly right. So the, the popularity of rom-com uh, proves my point. Uh, we don't know uh-huh. what the hell we're doing. And we can't, back to the square one principle, we can always distill everything down to only when we are healed of our two-thirds inauthentic, emotively inauthentic protector version of being, are we going to know how to negotiate two and four together. It has nothing to do with how many times do you see in rom-coms uh, Hey, did you ever? You know, I want to just yell at the uh, the the the, co- the co-stars there. Uh, did you ever hear of therapy? You know, uh, <laughs> it's like uh, in romantic relationship is 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 for a lot of people is therapy. Um, they don't go to a therapist to work out their individual uh, uh, aspects. They're working it out uh, somehow in the horizontal relationship, yeah, or possibly with, with the best friend. But it was what was that rom com with uh, uh, Meryl Streep as the therapist, and she was. Um... Uh, remember that one that was the had that she had the thing about Q-tips, and and the guy was going to her as a therapist, and and he was dating her, her daughter. Her daughter, yes. I that's can't right. remember the name of that movie. I, I can't either. Um, but yeah, uh, or or the one that makes me want to scratch all the skin off my face <laughs> is uh, the one with Barbara Streisand and Nick Nolte, where she's the psychiatrist and he's the patient, and they have a torrid sexual relationship. Uh, while giving lip service to, um, oh, um, I, 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 we're not supposed to do this, you know. And, and she doesn't lose her license, just like the Meryl uh, Streep film. Cor- yeah, correct, yes. Yeah. So uh, what, what? where was the track? Oh, uh, rom-coms Sorry. is a true But why don't you do therapy instead of trying to use your relationship to uh, grow? Um, that may be the first time the existence of a movie genre has been used to make a metaphysical point. I'd like to congratulate you on that. Wow. <laughs> now, see, the reason I love doing podcasts with Joseph is he, he says things that I don't never think of because I'm too busy being what I'm being. And I, can't, <laughs> I can't really see what I am until Joseph reflects it to me. Yes, that's right. I don't think there's ever been a core, a, 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 a conflation of metaphysical uh, um, uh, um, philosophy and, uh, and rom And the existence of a genre. Yeah, I don't think Dick Hart ever used that as in any argument for, <laughs> That's for right. his treatise. That's right. So what, what, what we'd like to explore here, slow motion uh, as we can here, we're going to be communicating in spirals here, not linear, because when we're talking about two and four bandwidths, there's nothing linear about it. It's all, it goes in spirals. So please forgive us as we go down various rabbit holes uh, at, at various moments here. Um, what constitutes healthy lust? What constitutes healthy and mature love? Uh, those are the, the the cornerstones of our exploration here. And if we say that while your fourth is um, uh, got a, carrying a, a whole ton of unconscious woundedness, you're going to have a protective shield over four in some degree. It's going to be plugged up. Uh, and if you have one in four, you're likely going to have something going on in two also. Because whether the at, whether there was too much sec, uh, hypersexualization in my uh, uh, upbringing, um, I, I talked to my um, sister, grown sister and grown brother these days, and, and still there, we say what one of us will say one thing, and then the other other one will go off on a whole sexual track that our mother's condition, our mother conditioned us into. Wow. Um, but at any rate, uh, um, what what uh, the absence of healthy sexual vibes in a a home growing up what does that look like what does that look like uh are the parents silent and embarrassed do they uh as a lot of kids a lot of my friends um uh, my women friends that uh, when i was learning getting knowing how to be learning how to be friends with girls uh, early which i was first at first 
the father or the mother would just give them a book. And, and same thing uh, with uh, with boys. They would give their kids That's a book. That's what I got. I got a yeah. book. Yeah. yeah. Um, that right there, um, we can um, easily translate. Um, here's Mama and Papa. We have no idea. We're embarrassed by this whole topic. Uh, yeah. uh, we, we, we struggle with it ourselves, so we don't know what we're doing. So please look, look at here's the biophysical uh, version explanation of it. But there's no very little social context, social context for sex growing up. You can get the biophysical at school, uh, sex ed, but who's talking about the cultural and social aspects of what do you, what do you do when you're got an itch for a, a, um, a, the opposite gender in one case? Uh, what, 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 what do you do? What does a boy do? What does a girl do? What, How do you know when it's okay to kiss someone? Exactly. You know, like, yeah, when I is got the absolutely right, zero of all that. How many kids get that kind? It's all devolved to trial and error and we wonder why as adults we're still trying to figure out um, how to balance lust and love in, in our lives even if those of us um, who are are, are have long-term monogamal relationships because as, as you keep peeling the onion you'll find deeper and deeper reasons to um, to heal some stuff so you can get to the next level of how two and four go together in an intimate relationship so we get literally no help um, uh, from our, our, at least in this country, and even less in places like India um, or the Middle East, where the where marriages are arranged, uh, and children are 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 uh, kept from, um, except little boys, uh, of course. Um, uh, uh, little boys uh, uh, are are uh, not off the playing field for a lot of Islamic men, because they're proscribed um, technically uh, by conservative Islam not to have sex um, uh, uh, until they're married. And if they do, it's with a whore. They're a hoori. It's a, some sort of negative uh, connotation with a woman. So they will do like um, um, uh, Socrates uh, was enculturated. And here's where we part with diversity. Okay, f having sex with little boys um, it was, was normal for Socrates. Well, cultural diversity, don't you know? Mm. Uh, identity comes in and says, wait just a minute, time out. Um, just because a cultural um, teaching uh, is unique to a culture doesn't make it humanly appropriate or spiritually applicable. Uh, you, you, just, you just can't use cultural diversity. Uh, today, Socrates would be put in jail as a pedophile. <laughs> yeah, he would. Uh, uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, identity looks for the looks through all all cultural conditioning and asks lives into the question what is an emotionally emoto spiritually mature way to manage sexuality and balance it with heart uh, and that's that's where we begin our conversation anything we we rabbit hole down is still on that main track and identity will offer uh, some will infer what what how it is what what are those cleaner versions irrespective of cultural conditioning because that's the third layer now that i uh, we're talking about it we talked about the um the uh, uh distorter refractor of reality uh caused by un unconscious emotional wounding then we talked about the the uh, uh refraction of dualisms uh that uh, distort reality and we left out the third one which is conditioning Conditioning mm. teaches us to see what we see and feel what we feel and know what we know. It sets boundaries. Don't go there. Go here. Go. Don't go there. Don't go here. Uh, if you, I grew up in an Italian um, household, it was hypersexualized, and so there was no there was no repression of anything uh, in our household. When, when my mother got on the podium uh, that way. Uh, my father would just silently use his handkerchief a little too much uh, uh, his at dinner, uh, and most he would say is "Oh, Diane, oh, Diane," you know, is all he would ever say. Huh. So, uh, in, the, in our in our family, uh, my mother would just say, "Just say it as call it as it is. Say it as it is. You know, don't don't no filters." And yet, she um, she my mother, bless her heart, uh, did the best she could do, and and oh my God. Uh, supported three boys. I was the oldest, then another, then another. My parents both wanted us to all go to college. One of us be a doctor, one be a lawyer, maybe one be a dentist. Uh, but basically, that was the deal. But my sister was discouraged by my mother to go to college because only whores go to college, don't you know? What? Uh, 
Now that's the other side which exposed my mother's hypersexuality, for example, as a compensation. Because when it came to her own daughter, her own daughter, uh, and she was hugely judgmental about women uh, and girls who slept around, constantly uh, denigrating them. So my sister was discouraged from going to college uh, because the only whores go to college. That was a direct quote. Um, wow. And, and that would so, have been like, what, mid 60s, late 60s, um, late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. Right. Um, so in that sense, I was the eldest and I, I fought that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I raised my sister. I was nine years older than her. And so when she was 11, I was 20. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, growing up in those ages, she came to me to talk mm -hmm. about sex and, and, and what's going on here. And um, and so I raised her in a lot of ways to be a strong woman and, and, and try to fight my mother's repression to keep her um, uh, down. My mother had wonderful side to her, support and love and respect, but she also had this, and it went, and unfortunately, it uh, focused down on my younger sister. So in that sense, my, my mother and I got in huge fights over, over my sister's uh, education. Uh, mm. she, she was discouraging my sister to... Um, to uh, uh, not be sexually active until she got married. Well, she um, and the net result is um, uh, she married her her not her high school sweetheart, but her grammar school sweetheart. Wow! <laughs> but he's a great guy. I love him. He's a brother to me. Um, but uh, she she would often say, and 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 he would agree. That we laugh about this uh, in old days uh, that my sister raised him to be her husband. <laughs> Whoa! Uh, now. We can laugh about that. It's sweet. And in our picture of things, um, this is a tragedy in, in a way. They have a, they've they been married 40-some years, uh, uh, imperfect like all marriages are. Uh, longevity is not necessarily a, um, a monogamous, uh, well, let's just say marriage, not monogamous or not mon monogamous. Yeah. Uh, longevity is no measure of the health of a relationship. Um, sure. Most of the time, it's people shrinking to fit uh, because it's just too too exhausting to think of doing something different and breaking yeah. up their life in, in another way. But anyway, I say all this um, be, is a real live example and uh, support my sister. She's a lovely being, psychic, great. We're very close. Uh, no criticism whatsoever. Just that we've had a lot of, a lot to deal with uh, that way. But but what's the? How do parents condition their children to socially and culturally? relate to sex. Uh, what what does the social space say about sex? So we, we don't get very much help. And I just gave an extreme example of no help whatsoever in, in that one way, except don't do it if you're a girl. And if you're a guy, hey, did you get laid this past weekend, yeah. buddy? You know, it's just the total uh, double uh, standard that way. So this is problematic for all of us. Um, and uh, identity wants to literally scratch begin to scratch the surface on how can we talk about all the polarizations uh, that go along with putting four and two together how do we roll lgbtqia plus uh, formats into that um, uh, what what about uh, um, the original uh, non-cisgender what, what about homosexuality which is still an, now an old term um, yeah. it's kind of disrespectful to even use that same we use same gender uh, relationality, uh, same same gender and intimacy and, and identity. Uh, how do we sort through all that? Uh, is is there uh, is, is would identity say that the only truly emotive, soulful way of transacting sexual intimacy is cisgender people? And would say, of course not, of course not. On the other side, we would say though, be, be careful. That's fine. Um, in all other LGBTQIA versions of sexual intimacy. But you want to be equal in all ways with cisgender conditioning. That's fine. Um, have at it. Uh, whatever you feel, where you feel you need to be, be there. But just remember, there's just as much codependency and unhealthiness in LGBTQIA plus intimacies as there are in cisgenders. We're equal mm -hmm. in that domain, too. And the conversation is so tipped these days to LGBTQIA support and glowing courage it takes to do it. All oh, that's yeah. true. But wait a minute, there's just as much uh, crap uh, and codependent crap going on in, in non cisgender relationships as cisgender. So I just want to put that headline out there to know that 
because a lot of people uh, in the past thought uh, that uh, that identity would um, um, eschew anything but uh, male female intimacy, and that and that uh, we, we would say. However, we do say one thing that we have to get out whatever in our my, my generations uh, get our yayas out. However, we get our yayas out. And if that means having sex with a neighbor's dog um, and the dog's amenable to it, have at it <laughs> if that's what it is. As long you, as it's consensual. Yeah, as long as sure. it's consensual, right. You don't want to um, rob poor uh, 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 Fido. Of, Fido, uh, of course, was uh, the word that was looking for. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, of his virginity of, of her, <laughs> or virginity, whatever way you want to play with it. The, the whole idea here in identity is go wherever you feel you need to go but after all is said and done, after three or 400 lifetimes, you learn something. And identity just offers, doesn't ask anyone to believe this. Please don't believe any of this. But by the time you get to 450 plus lifetimes uh, in this epic anyway, um, uh, you've learned a few things by being around the block that time. And you realize that grownups, a mode of the mature grownups do cisgender male female because they've learned over time that that has the most challenge and the most depth to the transaction of soul to soul that there's something in the physical contours that's a clue it doesn't mean that anything that doesn't follow the physical attributes is wrong or bad or immoral or societal or or horribly sinful it's not it's all fine it's all fine it's just that you, when you get to this many lifetimes, you, you, you develop different tastes, just like you are. You have a different, I have a different whole diet uh, in my mm -hmm. sub as I did when I was 16. So it's the same principle here. There's a diet, it's like a diet thing. You're not drawn to the foods of other kinds of sexual ways, transact sexuality. You're just not. And it's, 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 it's hard, hard fought because I, I can tell you being the kind of being that I am, I've done everything under the sun in past lives, everything. There's nothing new under the sun, everything. Um, uh, and in the end, you suss it out that your diet changes and you go with what may have been all along, divine being saying, doesn't really care where you put your genitals. It really doesn't. It only is interested in why you put them there. And those are always emoto soulful um, uh, dynamics at point for why you want to do it. Not strictly, they're genetic, uh, there's cultural conditioning, there's family conditioning, there's genetic conditioning. It's a big complex brew that identity can sort out pretty clearly. And we'd like to talk about that, but I want to start out our first one here as closing for our first uh, uh, intimate uh, um, podcast that uh, we're inclusive, not exclusive uh, uh, of, for all gender um uh, versions that are going on out there in the in the world that's making a lot of people crazy uh, at this point. And uh, identity says, let's take a breath. Um, love is love is love. Uh, but for a, a good share of both cisgender and non-cisgender relationship, it isn't love that's driving it. It's yeah. sexuality. It's driving it. Um, let, uh, uh, same uh, yin to yin, uh, same gender relationality tends to be more about as much about love or more about love than just sex. Um, some long term uh, male to male uh, relationships. Uh, it's it's also about love, but the vast majority of of cisgender and non cisgender. Uh, relational spaces are driven by sex because we realize sex is what makes us different than a friendship. Um, it makes it different than a friendship. Uh, so yeah, it is an, an important inclusion, but how and why we relate to sex the way we do is all a function of our emotional soulful wound. Yeah, you know, it, it makes me think of, um, you know, been listening to what you're saying, it makes me want to say, uh, coin the term um, uh, like, coming out in service or celebration of diversity in service or like the mm -hmm. freedom to express sexuality however you want in mm -hmm. service. And it makes me think of uh, a gay couple that I know that th their relationship is really doesn't look healthy at all from mm -hmm. even 25 feet. But it seems to be that there's so much of a um, look, we get to do this vibe yeah. 
mm-hmm. that sort of layers over. Well, therefore, we don't have to really look at how it's not working. Right. Um, and that's understandable. It, it is. And there are some cisgenders who are hiding their true um, uh, genetic or cultural conditioning and should be in uh, same gender relationships. There are people who are in same gender relationships that are acting out of woundedness and should be cisgender. There's no judgment on either side here. If we're all equally wounded, all of us, no matter our sexual expression, Mm -hmm. then when you say in service, coming out in service, what what Joseph, Joseph is referencing there is that we're all emotionally wounded and until you look at your unconscious and emotional woundedness, it, your coming out could be in service of hiding from certain wound issues in you that you don't want to face. All unconscious, hence the term unconscious. So in that sense, uh, all the rancor and the din and the white noise that's going on about uh, LGBTQIA plus stuff is, um, is it's white noise because it's, it's we're talking about the downstream final form that's crystallizing that has a right to be whatever it is. But what's all the upstream contributions to that? What's going on? Geneticists can't tell us. Um, yeah. uh, sociologists can't tell us. Um, uh, it's, it's PC woke to support every uh, everything about the uh, um, the LGBTQIA uh, plus um, dynamics, uh, and we identity is no different. We support everything that way, and just like we do with cisgenders, what's going on in the unconscious? Uh, well, and that, there's a question that could get you canceled. Yes, absolutely. It just happened, uh, somewhat somewhat related. Did you hear about Scott Adams, the Dilbert guy, getting canceled in this last week? Yeah, and uh, yeah, I I forget what it was it actually for it's racism. It's racism. Oh, racism, right? Other, other dynamic. Yeah. And he did say some you know semi racist things, but one of the things I, I read in this um uh, who it was an NPR article that referenced it and it said like in the past he's um, questioned the Holocaust numbers and there was a a, a, leak, a link there and I love Dilbert so it was news to me that Scott Adams was a Trump supporter and all that yeah. so I was like alright well I love Scott Adams let me see what he actually said about this it was not nearly as bad as it was characterized and his questioning of the Holocaust numbers was more about how did they get the information I'm curious related to how did they get this other information like let's find out the context the same way we're talking you know, what, what's the motive behind this sexual expression? Um, but those kinds of questions can easily be interpreted like, well, you're judging that and that's not OK. And now you're canceled. Well, you know, to me, canceling would be a, a proof of my integrity, you know, getting canceled. Uh, I would revel in it uh, if I got canceled and by some other kind of worldview. Uh, what does that really mean? Who cares if you're canceled or not? Who cares? Emotive limiter people are confident they don't care what you call them. They just don't. So the whole system of the whole canceling woke PC thing is all based in insecurities. We Confident people don't care what other people call them. They don't care. Uh, they, they know who they are. They become who they are, uh, really. So in that sense, um, uh, uh, when we're talking about this topic, which is really a hot one at the moment, um, uh, when when the difference, well, let's just say Trumpism is to the middle of the road um, uh, conservative uh, Republican, as wokeism is to the normally progressive Democrat. Wokeism mm-hmm. is not the same as progressive. It's the toxic version of liberalism, just like Trump is the toxic version of conservatism, right? Mm. So in these in that in that domain, um, uh, all we want to make as a, um, a we, we're living into a question: What if? And we'll complete on this, Joseph. Today, I'm okay. getting a little hoarse. <clears throat> yeah, you've been talking uh, a lot, right? Yeah, I've, you. I've talked more in this one. Uh, usually, it's been about pretty equal between us, but I'm talking. Yeah, I didn't today. sleep so well last night. That may be a factor. So sorry. No problem. I'm not doing my share. It's okay. We live into the question: What would an how what what sec in this last domain? What in what con- configuration would an emotively mature person blend to and for? We live into that question. That's all. We don't have strict answers. We just have we live into questions in identity. 
And so if we say that all non-cisgender people are just as codependent and and, and emotively uh, injured and inauthentic as cisgendered people are, um, join the crowd. We're not judging you. And what's going on there? Is there some wounds that might be contributing to it or is it all genetic? What is it? Is it what is it because is it your father uh, represented a certain template of male or your mother a certain template of female or vice versa? My mother um, had the lingam uh, in our household and my father had the yoni. Do you know what, what kind of confusion that would hold for a, a, a being like me you know yeah, it was um, the same for me and that's not uncommon at all but it takes a certain set of eyes to be able to see it absolutely uh i didn't have a, a, a healthy ro a male role model uh the mother had the yang and the father had the yin so boy was i i never was um, drawn to anything but cisgender but it was really confusing to know how to be a man what that meant because uh, i had a ton of yin uh 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 in me consciously growing up uh, and being a boy and an athlete and everything else. It was very confusing. So back to the main thing, we were living into questions here, not giving definitive answers. We're inclusive of everything and the diet in sexual domains, um, when you get to be an old soul, uh, is different than the diet of a younger soul or a middle-aged soul on the planet. As we said in our earlier podcasts, uh, the three main distortions uh, of, of what confuses the human beings, uh, the human population. Oh, it was the, the very beginning. Yeah, it was in the first soul five. age. Soul mm -hmm. age yeah. is explains 70, 60, 70 percent of of our travails on the planet. Right. Same thing here. Now we'll, we'll close with that, that an older soul will have a different diet. And it doesn't mean younger souls shouldn't do what they're doing. Have at it and talk to me in 300, 400 lifetimes and we'll have a, a cup of espresso uh, uh, in the uh, Divic, uh, whatever soul species you are. Perhaps you. then the podcast will still be going on then. We'll be on our 5,336th <laughs> episode. And you can catch up, pick up where well, you left off. Well, I, I actually think, Joseph, um, after we're both uh, dropped the body here this lifetime, we'll continue uh, doing the podcast and we'll find some channeling uh, people still on the planet <laughs> and they can channel the podcast and they'll go back and forth. Here's Joseph. Joseph will say one thing, then Daniel or Stace will yeah. say the other thing. And da, 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 Brilliant. Yeah. And there'll be technology yeah. to make that easy by then, I'm yeah. sure. Sure. Yeah. We'll, we'll have some sort of skull cap that uh, enhances the uh, spiritual vibrations or something. Brilliant. Love it. Let's let somebody invent that. And uh, so we're going to continue on intimate uh, sexualized relationality next time. You've got more on that subject. Oh, baby. <laughs> we haven't even scratched the surface. <laughs> In two words. Yes, there's more. Yeah, okay. there's more. Right. Well, thank you, Stace. Thank you, listeners. Thanks for hanging with us for 50 episodes. If you've been listening in order and uh, yeah, tune in next time. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening to the Heart of Soul podcast. To learn more about Stace Barron and Identity, please visit identity.org. To learn more about Joseph Shapiro, visit clearandopen.com. Until next time, we wish you well on your journey.